Welcome back to the Complete History of Coffee, Episode 17, Coffee in World War I. Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and let's get started. At noon on Saturday, August 1st, the German ultimatum to Russia expired without a Russian reply. Within an hour, a telegram went out to German ambassador in St. Petersburg, instructing him to declare war by 5 o'clock that afternoon. At 5 o'clock, the Kaiser had decreed general mobilization. War pressed against every frontier. Suddenly, dismayed, government struggled and twisted to fend it off. It was no use. Agents at Frontiers were reporting every cavalry patrol as a deployment to beat the mobilization gun. General staffs, goaded by the relentless timetables, were pounding the table for the signal to move lest their opponent gain an hour head start. Appalled upon the brink, the chiefs of state, who would be ultimately responsible for the country's fate, attempted to back away, but the pull of military schedules dragged them forward. These were excerpts from the guns of August, showing the tensions which built up before the start of the war. If you're tuning in for the first time for our episode on World War I, then I'd like to welcome you. You may find you might want to skip ahead a little bit, as around the first 15 minutes or so are going to be setting us up for the coffee industry leading into World War I. So if World War I and coffee within World War I is the only interest you have, then feel free to skip ahead a little bit, but I do recommend listening to the full episode to get the whole story. And for our returning listeners, welcome back. As always, I will be doing a coffee tasting. Today, we're going to be doing Folgers. Um, I haven't actually tried Folgers too many times, maybe once or twice. Um, I'm also doing it specifically as an instant coffee, just because today we're going to be talking about the origin of instant coffee. I picked Folgers specifically because we recently talked about Folgers when we were talking about the origin of name brands. Go ahead and start with smelling it. Definitely has a very light smell. A um, little bit of a roasty, kind of sweet. Mm. Overall, the flavor's pretty flat. Um, it's not really indicating too much to me either direction not a whole lot of roasty that you might expect from like a dark roast and it's not like a light acidic like you might expect from a blonde so I'm definitely more of a medium roast there's um, a little bit of a nutty uh, almost hazelnut flavor to it but it's also kind of got a uh, earthy herbal to it as well really not sticking out as too much of any specific flavor my assumption is that's probably intentional this was probably designed to be a more flat, uh, balanced flavored type of coffee, just so that way it's um, more of an everyman's drink, a cup of joe, if you will. Looking back at Latin America, Cuba became the primary coffee producer following Haiti's revolution. However, during the mid-late 19th century, Cuba shifted away from coffee towards sugar production to the point of needing imported coffee from Puerto Rico by the end of the century. Brazil, in contrast to Cuba, shifted away from sugar production to coffee. Brazil, by 1906, was producing nearly 90% of all the coffee in the world. American consumption and Brazil's ability to keep up with the U.S. demand was the key to their sudden near monopoly of coffee. Because Brazil's economy was dependent on coffee, as the world supply of coffee became higher than the demand, coffee began dropping in price, leading to a crisis. In response, the first international congress over coffee was held at the New York Coffee Exchange in 1902. Most coffee-producing nations in Latin America attended, realizing something needed to be done. However, this did not mean they would agree on a solution. Coffee-growing nations, of course, wanted more money, while those who purchased the coffee wanted lower prices. They decided to ban triage coffee, a defective type of coffee bean, which affects overall quality, and they wished for a reduction in European import taxes, as America had already abolished its tariffs on coffee. 
Brazil, for its part, increased taxation on coffee plantations and banned planting new coffee trees for five years. This, unfortunately, seems to have affected workers more than plantations, as many lost their jobs. Further, while a good start to curving overproduction of coffee, the effect of the ban wouldn't be felt until 1907 since it takes up to four years for trees to produce coffee and around another four to slow down in coffee production. The same year, the Brazilian government considered valorization. Valorization refers to increasing the value of something, in this case, coffee. Essentially, the government would buy the local coffee and then store it until there was a lack of coffee on the international market to keep the price of coffee higher. But the federal government did not want to invest the money. Instead, a German broker flipped the bill by loaning one million pounds to Sao Paulo. Now returns Herman Sicklin to our story, the former business partner of the sugar king, Havmeyer. Sicklin was a German immigrant who moved to Costa Rica and then to the United States, picking up both Spanish and English along the way. He eventually ended up working for W.H. Crossman and Son as a salesman. He secured an important business deal in Latin America and became a partner in the company. With his rising wealth and influence, Brazil sought out Sicklin's help in regulating coffee prices internationally. He set up a syndicate of British and German banks to purchase excess coffee from Brazil in October of 1906. They essentially loaned Brazil money with coffee acting as collateral. Brazil seems to have gotten the short end of the stick here because they were technically paying for 20% of the cost to buy the coffee from farmers and then were charged for storage and interest on said coffee. Sao Paulo was unfortunately still producing too much coffee, and by December, Brazil's government could no longer afford to purchase 20% of the coffee. To make matters worse, Sao Paulo needed to pay back that £1 million loan they received back in August of that year. Sicklin had to get them a second loan of £3 million from a bank in London, one in New York, and even some of his own money. Paying off the previous loan, they entered 1907 with £2 million to invest in their failing coffee market. The following year, Sicklin set up a committee of seven, which controlled all of the stored coffee. He placed himself on the committee along with one representative from Brazil. This left Brazil essentially no longer in control of their own coffee, but they were still required to pay for their part of the coffee, its storage and interest. Ultimately, the committee held a monopoly on most of the world's coffee and was able to double the price of coffee in 1911. At this point, the United States became rather upset at the increased price of coffee. Apparently, for around two years, the U.S. Department of Justice was collecting information on the committee's valorization of coffee, specifically to build a case against Herman Sicklin. A small roaster first brought the issue to the attention of the U.S. Attorney General, George Wickersham, but it wasn't long before a congressman, also named George, requested the Attorney General investigate the case. The congressman was George Norris, and so we don't get confused. I'll refer to him as Representative Norris, and George Wickersham will simply be called Attorney General. Norris took the case to the House of Representatives, summarizing his case to them and suggesting they impose a duty on Brazil as a means to stop this valorization scheme. While Norris was initially unsuccessful, some newspapers took up the case. One in New York preached a boycott of Brazilian coffee, while another called for the Department of Justice to launch an investigation. Arbuckle Brothers, the previous rival of Sicklin, began using the valorization of coffee to their advantage. See, Arbuckle and Sicklin would sell coffee directly to roasters, completely leaving out the coffee exchange. In fact, Arbuckle would go as far as buying coffee from the exchange and then reselling it to the public at a higher price. In response, the Attorney General, along with Representative Norris, decided to prosecute. Sicklin was brought before a Congressional Committee in 1912, known as the Money Trust Investigation. To summarize the hearing, Committee lawyer Samuel Untemeyer asserted the purpose behind the coffee scheme was to limit the surplus of coffee on the market, to which Sicklin said was not the case. Then, Sicklin got into a battle of semantics over control of coffee because, 
Apparently, he just wanted to sell it at a higher cost, not control the price of coffee. Yeah, Untermeyer got him backed into a little bit of a corner on this use of semantics. In response, Sicklin claimed all of the coffee being held in storage at the moment would not really affect the price of coffee that were all released right now, and then decided to start snapping to emphasize his point. Of course, Untermeyer questioned this, and Sicklin resorted to snapping with every response, as if he was doing some early 20th century equivalent of a mic drop. But returning with some actual good points, which would have been a better point for a mic drop, Sicklin pointed out the price of coffee had been much higher in the last quarter of the 19th century. Further, valorization had not increased coffee past the point where it had been in previous decades, and it was likely he kept the price from spiking from overproduction, which would have flooded the market and led to an overall lack of coffee. He then closed by pointing out how it was unfair for the U.S. to prevent Brazil from making money. So it appeared the committee was unsuccessful, but that didn't mean Sicklin was free from any legal recourse. The attorney general proceeded to press charges, which prevented Sicklin from leaving the country, and then obtained a temporary restraining order to take 900,000 bags of coffee from the syndicate's warehouse in New York, even levying charges against other members of the syndicate. Brazil responded by demanding a release of their stored coffee, which the U.S. decided to comply with. However, Sicklin would now be the primary target of the Attorney General. Sicklin was asked to release all of the bags in New York, but managed to negotiate it down to only 700,000 bags in exchange for all of his charges to be dropped. Sicklin was worried about damaging relations with Brazil, but attempted to have all of the coffee sold within a few months. Brazil was not on board, which led the Attorney General to threaten Sickland and others who were part of the scheme. The Secretary of State wished to prevent endangering relations with Brazil, but it seems Sao Paulo was unwilling to budge. Representative Norris created a bill to sell off all of the valorized coffee, but the National Coffee Roasters Association denounced the bill. It was reported this vote was, in fact, green coffee bean sellers, not roasters, who wanted to prevent such a bill. But in any case, William Eukers, the influential journalist on coffee we talked about previously, wrote to the Attorney General about how Brazil overproduced every year more coffee than the world could consume, and it shouldn't be the responsibility of American consumers to flip the bill. Adding to this, Brazil and Cyclin decided to change the terms and wanted several more months to sell off the bags of coffee in storage. The Attorney General decided at this point to press charges and suddenly, surprise, surprise, all of the 700,000 bags were sold off. The Secretary of State informed him of what had occurred, which led to skepticism, but seems to have actually occurred. Brazil now was upset about the pending lawsuit and so launched a 30% tariff on American flour, leading to lashback toward the U.S. government from American flour exporters. Unfortunately, the Attorney General's term in office was coming to an end, which I guess would actually be fortunate in the case of Brazil and Cyclin. The new Attorney General received a memo urging him to continue the case against Cyclin in Brazil, because no one was ever given evidence of these 700,000 bags actually being sold off. But the new attorney general had no interest in the case and so dropped it. It is interesting to note, Sicklin's actions, while clearly in his own benefit, did help to stabilize the global coffee market and likely Brazil's government. In fact, without Sicklin, there may have been a revolution in Brazil. So this time around, coffee seems to have prevented a political revolution. Or would Brazil's potential revolution have been a result of coffee? Let's not overthink it. At this point in 1913, 3.1 million bags of coffee were stored in Europe alone. And just one year later, at the start of the Great War, 2 million bags would be sold off. However, Germany held all of the funds in a bank in Berlin until after the war, at which point they paid Brazil back more than what was originally owed. Sicklin, for his part, had gone to Germany in October of 1914, believing the war would not take off to any real extent. Incredibly wrong, Sicklin was supposedly detained in Germany and extorted for his wealth. 
but others claim he in fact donated money to Germany as he was still very pro-German. Let's get into World War I. Leading into the war, Europe controlled over half of the world's coffee through ports like Hamburg, Haver, Antwerp, and Amsterdam. Germany was in many ways the world leader in coffee, as it was German coffee growers and exporters who dominated much of Latin America's coffee. Traditionally, this meant higher grade coffee for Germany and for Europe in general, as they were willing to pay for higher quality coffee. America, for its part, was left with lower grade coffee, partially because they relied on merchants from other nations to supply them with coffee. With declaration of war in Europe, America was left without a merchant fleet to import coffee. This flurry led the coffee exchange to even shut down for four months. But out of the confusion came a realization of America's opportunity to take over Europe's former role as king of the coffee market. The U.S. grew its merchant fleet, even using ships formerly for things like guano to now move coffee. American banks expanded into South America, and New York became the new economic center of the world. Brazil did not fare as well during the war as coffee prices dropped, and Europe was unable to loan them more money. They referred to this period of time as Quinquenio Sinistro, the five disastrous years. Direct shipping of coffee from Latin America to Europe slowed down considerably during the war, leading the U.S. to become the middleman in the coffee trade between Europe and Latin America. During the First World War, coffee and tea faced off. Tea was the primary drink of the Allies on the Western Front, while coffee fueled the Axis German army. England supplied its troops with over half an ounce of tea leaves daily, along with other rations like small amounts of lime juice and rum. Germans, by contrast, were supplied with nine-tenths of an ounce of coffee and one-tenth of an ounce of tea, meaning, put together, they received a whole ounce of coffee and tea every day. No wonder they were able to hold out against the Allied powers for so long. On top of this, they also received beer, wine, and liquor. An American roaster in 1915 noted how, quote, ordinarily British troops would drink tea, but it is said that coffee is being substituted because of its many stimulating effects. The other nations are also furnishing coffee to soldiers in large quantity, end quote. Everyone remembers the sinking of the Lusitania by Germany, but England impounded 12,000 bags of coffee from 13 different American ships, which they claimed were heading for Germany. And clearly playing both sides, the U.S. grew into the world's largest coffee re-exporter by shipping most of its coffee to Scandinavia for German consumption. Guatemala had some initial concerns over the war as Germany was the largest buyer of Guatemalan coffee before the war. However, California grew to become the primary buyer of their coffee during the war. As a trend towards Guatemalan, Colombian, and other Latin American coffees grew in the U.S. Germans in Guatemala had reason to fear, though, as the Guatemalan government suppressed German newspapers and certain prominent Germans in their country. After the United States entered the war in 1911, Brazil also declared war in Germany because of America's promise to purchase one million pounds of coffee for its troops. America also moved to influence Guatemala to confiscate coffee plantations owned by Germans, which their dictator, Estrada Cabrera, was more than happy to take control of for himself. America's entry into the war did not stop re-exporting to Scandinavia for German consumption but it did mean an increase in the need for coffee. Coffee was noted as being, quote, the most popular drink of the camp, end quote. I'm not sure, though, why this was the case, when most coffee was ground and poorly packed in the U.S. before being shipped to Europe, causing it to be very stale by the time it reached the troops. And to make matters worse, they used only five ounces of coffee to every gallon of water? Letting it sit out between meals and become a, quote, flat, stale, and unprofitable mess which resembled nothing so much as dishwater, end quote. 
Luckily, E.F. Holbrook was assigned to the quartermaster's department, where he suggested they adjust coffee brewing instruction and begin roasting coffee closer to the front lines, like they had been doing with baking bread. He argued for the fact coffee expands after roasting, so shipping green coffee beans would actually save space on ships. He was ultimately successful, and General Pershing was able to have roasting machines and professional roasters brought over to make it happen. By the war's end, the U.S. Army was roasting 750,000 pounds of coffee every day. Herbert Hoover's Food Administration took over the coffee market in 1918, freezing the price of coffee and other goods to prevent them from going up. This was actually the opposite, as the price of coffee had been dropping throughout the war. But Hoover did not care to change his policy surrounding coffee. Another solution to the lack of fresh coffee was created just before the war. Instant coffee. Instant coffee is credited to a handful of individuals from around the world during the 1900s. And in fact, as far back as possibly 1771 in England. However, its importance and use in World War I came from a Belgian man, George Washington, who may actually have been a descendant of the first American president. In 1910, Mr. Washington opened up a business in New York, G. Washington's Refined Coffee. His business did gain some success before the war, but it was in 1918, after the U.S. Army requested the company's product, that instant coffee really took off. The company announced G. Washington's Refined Coffee had gone to war. And it wasn't long before this instant coffee was a smashing success amongst the troops. American soldiers often called for a cup of George and wrote of how it helped them get through the war. The need for instant coffee led to other companies making their own soluble coffees, increasing output of instant coffee to the point where some companies went under after the war ended and there was no longer such a need for it. Still though, Washington's coffee would survive, and it would be as a result of the Second World War that it became a great success. Seeing the war's end in sight, Brazil began raising its prices in anticipation of renewed Brazilian coffee consumption. Hoover was informed of the need for a free market of coffee merchants, but was again unmoved by such warnings. And now, just like happened after the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of American veterans were returning home with a newly acquired coffee addiction. The war had a lasting effect on coffee. Besides newly devoted coffee drinkers and the popularization of instant coffee, America was now largely in control of the coffee market. This was intensified by Clarence Bickford, a broker in San Francisco who began doing coffee cuppings. Cuppings led the way for coffee flavor profiles, which meant coffee could be classified by flavor notes rather than just roast or color. San Francisco's extensive railroad tracks made it a hub for coffee importing for the U.S. The construction of the Panama Canal in 1914 further increased the rise of coffee export out of Latin America into the U.S. and Europe. So, as it seems, coffee both led to victory and defeat in World War I, as England and Germany eventually both largely drank it to power through life in the trenches and face off against modern chemical and mechanized warfare. But, unfortunately, the war to end all wars was simply a setup for another, even more deadly war. So get ready, because in a few episodes we will be talking about coffee in World War II. We are fast approaching episode 20, so like episode 10, we will have a recap of everything in the show thus far. So if any of you have any questions or comments about the show, feel free to mention them on social media at the Complete History Podcast Series, or by emailing us at completehistorypod at gmail.com. As always, this show is written and produced by me, Eric Zaffer. If you have not already, please consider supporting this podcast series on Patreon. For the price of a coffee or tea a month, you can support this and future projects in the series while getting access to members' episodes, access to transcripts of the show, and a chance to win merch. Make sure to join our community on social media at the Complete History Podcast Series. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on, and make sure to share it with your family and friends. 
To close, instead of a quote today, I wanted to mention one popular theory on where the term Cup of Joe comes from. Shortly before the war, in June of 1914, the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, known as Joe, initiated Order 66 to wipe out the Jedi Order. Oh, wait, I, I guess he actually implemented General Order 99, which banned alcohol. So, pissing off all of the sailors in the Navy and leaving them with nothing but coffee, they began calling it a cup of joe in spite. There are other theories for this term, but this passive-aggressive one is definitely my favorite explanation for why many drink a cup of joe today.